Hello everyone, this is John with John Monarchic Fine Art and I'm welcoming you to another video. This is the painting we're going to be doing today. It's on a piece of uh, ampersand gesso board 18 by 24 and we're going to be using Griffin Elkid oil paints. So stick around for the whole video. You're going to see how you have a sketch that just doesn't work out and then you just improvise. So I'll see you in a little bit. Take care. Hello everyone and here we go with our video. This is the sketch that I had made out, and for whatever reason, I just didn't like it. Don't ask me why, I just didn't. So what I did was, I decided when I get frustrated that there's a sketch that I don't like, I just start throwing paint onto the um, canvas. In this case, it's the uh, gesso board. And I've got a little bit of blue, I've got a little bit of red, i got a little bit of purple, i got a little bit of Payne's Gray I'm putting in right now. And I'm just throwing in color. At the moment, there's no white, there will be shortly to kind of blend it together. Um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of share with you with this one is it's really easy, especially with oil painting. Acrylics you can do too because they're so permanent and so quick. Oh, by the way, there's going to be, I hope this doesn't annoy you too much. I am going to have a lot of uh, shedding bristles in this painting. I don't know why my uh, brush just started shedding. Granted, it's a new brush, so, you know, that happens sometimes, but it got a little annoying at times. But anyways, um, what I was talking about was you most of the time, at least for me anyways, I'm not sure how it is for anybody else, I rarely finish with the painting I start. Um, even if I have a sketch that I like, I always alter things as I go. And as I'm painting, it's like, okay, this doesn't work. I want to go in a different direction. Well, this sketch, I didn't even put one piece of uh, one brush stroke down. And I loved the sketch when I did it probably about three, four days ago. And then for whatever reason, I just, I got it up there and I got ready to do the video and I said, nah, this ain't gonna work. And that's when I just started throwing color up there and seeing what can happen. Now I'm gonna work a little bit on this sky, um, a little longer than I normally do. I wanted, obviously not perfect, this is painting, but I wanted to get a different feel than I normally do. And I was really thinking about keeping it right where it's at now. And for whatever reason, I didn't because it would work doing it this way. But I do add some uh, palette knife clouds that I blend. And I do that a couple times, actually. And the paint just got a little thicker than I wanted to. And um, I didn't want to take too much off, but I do end up scraping some with the palette knife off. And it's just this painting, the final result I liked and I was very pleased with. But there was quite a bit, especially in the beginning of redoing things to get it to that point. So one of the things I'm hoping you get from this video is even if it starts going bad in the beginning, don't worry about it. You can always repair it, fix it, alter it, do whatever you need to do. It's an oil painting. I don't know if you can see it, but that paint is really thick and it's a little thicker than I wanted to. So it, the brush wasn't and then, like I said, I'm not trying to blend when I'm doing that with the brush. I'm just trying to move the color around to get the fluffy, soft shapes of the clouds that I want. So you saw right there that I just started scraping some off with a palette knife just to get it a little easier to fluff, let's say. But even though I still do it a couple more times and there's a lot of stuff I take off, it just, it was fighting me a lot in the beginning. And then those bristle hairs coming off was really starting to annoy me. And I'm glad this one wasn't live. Because there's a couple of words that I said at that, uh, at that brush. I almost threw it across the room. It got uh, frustrating. But anyways, the sky usually isn't that difficult. And for whatever reason, today it was just, it was becoming very annoying. Okay, now one of the things I'm doing is I'm just throwing some Payne's Gray after I drop my palette knife. Throwing some Payne's Gray up there. And what I want to do is I want to... I guess mean is a is the wrong word to use, but I want kind of an aggressive looking sky. I don't want it just plain anything. And as you can tell by the different color mixes I have in there, you know, I do have a decent amount of, let's say, aggressive color in there. And um, yeah, look at look at my face. It's like son of a gun one more time. Okay, now I'm starting to get the texture, the feel, the amount of paint that I'm comfortable with, and I'm able to fluff it. And I do a lot of fluffing 
to get some movement into these clouds and into the sky itself. And you notice when I'm doing it like that, there's two reasons why I'm doing that. Believe it or not, one is to get the little hairs off that um, shed, but the other is I use that stroke to fluff parts of the um, sky, and I also use that technique for the water at times, where I'll kind of grab the brush and do it on like an underhand motion upward. And that gets a nice, soft, fluffy feel to it, and it's something that I really enjoy. I got, I learned the technique originally from Stuart Davies, how he does his skies. I alter it. I don't do it exactly like him, but the technique is very similar, and I, the idea I got to do it this way was from him. So it's not like I invented this technique. He does it much better than I do, but this is kind of like my version of it. But uh, Stuart Davies, in my opinion, is the one that uh, started it. Okay, the sky is just about done, and the rest of the painting goes a little bit better. But uh, that first little while was an adventure, needless to say. And like I said, it's still shedding, and I usually don't have that much trouble. I use uh, cheap bristle brushes because uh, cheap ones seem to last as long as the good ones. But um, for some reason, today was just a brush shedding day. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to put in a little bit of uh, mountain range. It's not going to be a huge pronounced mountain range. It's going to be decent size, but not crazy. And I'm using my cheap little bristle brush there. And this is going to change a little bit as I go. You know, but I wanted some kind of, you know, hills and movement to contrast with the sky. This whole thing is going to be a nice river. And it's going to be some flowers, and it's going to have some trees, background, foreground. It's going to be a nice little mix. But my main area probably is going to be the sky. I'm not going to cover a lot of it with trees. As you can see, the mountains are a lot smaller, so I'm not going to cover a lot of them. And it's going to, the sky is going to be a little more pronounced than anything else um, in this uh, particular composition. Okay, now I'm going to get ready to highlight these mountains. And as you saw by the way I just painted them, they took seconds. You don't have to really get technical to paint mountains. Now, I take my time with some things like the highlights a little bit more. But I really, the shape is just make shapes. You know, I was uh, I, when I teach people how to paint, I always tell them, don't look at a mountain as a mountain or a tree as a tree. Try to look at them just as shapes. And... Go by how the shapes look, how the shapes are structured, and then tighten up to look like a tree or a mountain or whatever as you go. So what I'm doing here is just taking off the thick paint because I want the highlight to stick good. And one of the things I do like about this uh, gesso board, the hard wood, um, and linen canvas is also good for this too. It doesn't soak up as much. Is you can wipe off and have a real good tone still on your surface and i know you can do it with you know some cottons as well linen is good for it wood is the best and it scrapes off really easy and it just it makes it so much look at the way the highlight is just sitting on top like it's supposed to now i'm going to do a little bit more on the mountains than i normally do i wanted to get some real um, pronounced shadows in and then i'm going to go over the um, highlight um, with the knife again after I do some more shadows. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to make sure that I covered the grain of the uh, panel, of the wood, hardwood, and I wanted to make sure that I had a little bit more, a little bit more three dimension to the mountains. So here, this is basically French ultramarine with white. And um, I got more French ultramarine than the white because, you know, it's the shadow. So I want to make sure the shadow and the highlight, you know, aren't too close in value. And now I'm just kind of smoothing everything out. And the shadows is where I'm establishing the highlights, believe it or not. I got the highlights in about where I want them. And now what I'm doing is putting the shadows in. And then I'm going to redo the highlights based on where I put it in the shadow. I know that sounds a little crazy. But basically, I put in the highlights initially to give me an idea, like a little blueprint of where I want things to go. As I put in my shadow color, my shadow sides, that reinforces or slightly alters where my highlights will be. And now I'm going to 
finish it off. You know, you want your highlights to go over your shadows to a degree. And it just looks better that way to me. See, now you got that three-dimensional look. And it just, it's exactly pretty good about the way I want it to be. And some of this is going to be covered with trees. And not all of it, some of it. But it's all going to be in different areas more than, some areas a little more than others visible. If that makes any sense. This is a Sunday night, so sometimes my thought pattern isn't exactly where it needs to be. And that was just me overdoing a little bit. And then it's going to be covered with uh, some trees in that area. But I should have left it alone and didn't. I've been painting for a long time, and every once in a while I forget the old uh, adage about painting, less is more. And we're human beings, and every once in a while we kind of get into a, gro a groove, a rhythm, and then we kind of forget it and we overwork something. Okay, so I got a little bit of that uh, base color in, which is kind of like a back mid-ground for uh, the foothills, let's say, of the mountain. And now I'm putting in some nice trees. And if you notice, I'm not going too high in the trees, and I'm leaving a little bit of space to see behind the trees to see the mountains behind it. And now I'm just doing some grass. And this is um, olive green and a little uh, Payne's gray. No white as of yet. There will be a little bit later, but not uh, as of yet. And now I'm putting in a little bit of random trees. Okay, so why did I do it this way? I wanted the mountains on the right to be a little bit more pronounced than the ones on the left. If it was the other way around, then I'd put the denser trees, a little thicker trees on the right, and then the ones that are a little more sparse on the um, left. But this is just the way it kind of felt to me. And now I'm putting in some, like I said, I'm, for lack of a better phrase, distant mid-ground uh, grasses and stuff. And then I got that little thing on the left that's kind of like curving out. That's all going to be water now on the left side. And I'm going to have it go from right to left. So the smaller part of the river where it's being fed will be on the right and then it'll just go straight into the left and this is going to be with a little Payne's gray and it's going to have a little sap green and it's going to have uh, French ultramarine and I'm just going to put in the color first and then the white to make it look like water will come in after this is all done and one of the things you're noticing here is I'm not putting the water all the way up to that ground on the far river bank. What I'm going to do is instead I'm going to lift up with little reeds like um, elements so I'll have the land meet the water as opposed to water meeting the land. Is there a specific reason for that? Yeah, that's just the way I felt like doing it. You can bring the water up to the land, it doesn't matter as long as you're careful and it doesn't go too far in, but it's just a preference for this particular painting. So there's no you know special reason for it. And now I'm putting it in. As I'm going, I'm putting in more blue. But uh, I still have, and you can tell, some of the dark areas, the paint's gray, and a little bit of the uh, sap green to go with it. And the water, I'm kind of putting in all over the place at the moment. Water needs to stay flat, so your strokes need to go left to right, you know, horizontally well. But in this stage of the water, it's not really necessary. Um, you're just putting down color to kind of establish where it's at. And then once you put in the white that's going to make it look like water, that's when you have to make sure that your strokes are uh, horizontal. Okay, now we're talking a little bit of olive green and no white at all. That's why you can see it's not covering completely. It's you know looks a little paler. I'm not going to use the white until later. And this is all just making it up as I go along. The sketch I had, I followed absolutely no part of it. Like I said, for some reason, I didn't like it. Okay, this is the part I was talking about a few minutes ago where I'm making the land meet the water. And I'm just using the fan brush and I'm touching where the riverbank is on the far side and then pulling it up. And it's just real short strokes. And that's how the two are going to meet. 
And now, for the, I think, I'm not sure if I remember, but I believe the Far River Bank up is done. And now we're working on the Far River Bank down to complete this composition. And I don't remember what I did next. Yes, I do. I'm picking up more hairs. I had to do at least a dozen of them, it feels like, in this painting. And when the thing of it is, when it gets onto uh, wet paint, you know, usually it'll stick to it and go flat, so it's hard to pick up even with tweezers. Every once in a while you get lucky and you can kind of pick it up, but sometimes it becomes annoying. Okay, now I'm just putting the water in. And again, I'm keeping them reasonably horizontal, but this is going to change also. Um, this is just to kind of get a little bit of uh, opaqueness to it so you don't see the uh, texture of the hardwood underneath. And then I'm going to tap in some little waves to give it a little bit of movement, and then I'll use a bigger bristle brush to smooth those out, similar to the way I do clouds. And then that'll be the water, and then the water part will be done, and then it's just the foreground that'll be left. And the foreground, there's actually quite a bit to it. I'm going to put in some rock uh, formations and some uh, reeds with flowers. It actually turns out really pretty. I really, um, considering that I was just making it up as I go, and I had no idea when I started just throwing color onto, um, onto the sky, it came out a lot better than I anticipated. But every once in a while, you have to do that. You know, you just take whatever your plan was and throw it out. You know, I tell my wife, who's, uh, I'm teaching how to paint, it's painting, and especially landscape painting. Yes, you can be photorealistic and everything else. I am not wired that way, so I can't. I applaud the men and women that can, and children. You know, there's some kids that are very good, too. But I am not wired that way. So mine is kind of semi-realistic, you know, a little impressionism to it. And um, I don't fuss too much on certain areas. Sometimes I do. Like right now, I've got the color smoothed out. And now I'm using that underhand stroke to get those waves exactly how they're appealing to my eye. And that's kind of the whole trick to this technique. Is you want to kind of go from underneath and push up for the clouds and the water. And once you get that kind of movement that you're looking for, then that's when you leave it alone. Okay, now I'm just taking Payne's Gray and Raw Umber and Olive Green. And I think I have a little alizarin in this as well. Just making a real dark color. And I am putting in the reeds that the flowers will go on. And if you look at perspective, this is a perfect example of it right here. You got the taller reeds towards the front, and as they go into the back, they get smaller. And that just shows them receding into the back. And that's one of the laws of perspective. If you look at a horizon line, and then the lines that intersect, you're standing in the middle, and eventually they're going to disappear in your vision, even though they're parallel. If you stand on a pair, uh, in the, between railroad tracks, and stare into the future, uh, not the future, but into the distance, you're eventually going to see them converge, even though they don't. And that's one of the primary fundamentals of perspective, linear perspective. So this is the same thing. The bigger trees are in the front, and the smaller are as they go recede into the distance. Okay, so this is the foreground. And I got some rock formations. Why? I have no idea. Like I said, this whole thing was just... Uh, Spontaneous. I threw some color, started with the sky. I didn't even know what the sky was going to look like. I just started throwing color up and went. And I tell you what, I do a lot of sketching before I do painting, and I do some like this. And I enjoy painting ridiculously anyways. But truth be told, this is probably my favorite way to paint, not knowing where it's going and kind of just letting the paint evolve itself, letting it paint itself, so to speak. And that's one of the things that was very difficult for me to do when I first started is to kind of let go and allow the painting to develop itself and paint itself. And once you're able to do that, you really can create some beautiful pieces. And as this painting started to develop itself, I started to recognize it. And I just recognize it because I've been painting so darn long that, you know, I can tell when it's happening. And then I just kind of said, okay, wherever you want to go type of thing. 
It kind of takes on a life of its own, so to speak. And now what I'm doing is putting in the grass before I put in the rock highlights for one simple reason. It took me forever to stop being stubborn and putting the rock highlights in, putting the grass in, and destroying the rock highlights that I had to redo anyway. So I put in the grass, and then when I put in rock highlights, I only had to put them in once. So, note to self, don't be stubborn. I have a history of being stubborn about a lot of things. And then eventually it clicks in my head, and I uh, learn from it. Sometimes quickly, sometimes not as quickly enough. Okay, so now I've got the grass in. And I like tapping grass with some uh, things. And I'm also going to pull grass up with a fan brush. Because I enjoy making grass like that. Similar to how those uh, reeds in the water are. And how I connected the far bank with the river itself. That uh, kind of short, choppy, upward stroke with a fan brush is um, a way to make very realistic um, grasses and reeds and things like that. Okay, now we're going to highlight the rocks. Now, the rocks are in grass. And we're going to have some grasses over the base to kind of cement it into the composition. Right now it's kind of floating. You can see, right now you can see distinctly where it is, uh, where the rocks are and where the grass is, meadow let's say is. And you can tell it's two distinct planes. And what you need to do when you're doing landscape paintings is make it so you can't see where one starts and one stops. Kind of blend them together so they um, look like they're part of the landscape and not just kind of placed there. So that's what I'll be doing when I'm lifting up some different uh, reds and oranges and things like that. I'm going to get the um, shadow side of these done, make sure the highlight is good, and then those will be the finishing touches along with the flowers on the uh, reeves on the riverbank. The reeds, not the reeves. Reeves is something that played a great Superman, Christopher Reeve, God rest his soul. And then uh, Reeves actually is um, a student-grade paint company. They do paints like oils and uh, acrylics, watercolors. Not that anybody cares. It just kind of came to my mind. Sometimes I babble. I apologize. Okay, that's just a little chip brush, a one-inch brush I bought from uh, Michael's for like $1.50. And if you notice, I'm just using the edge of the brush, the bottom corner, let's say, to tap in these flowers. And I've got, uh, you know, the different values here. A little bit more white, a little bit more of the uh, alizarin crimson. Now I've got the dioxazine purple. And I think I put some yellow in here as well, just for a nice variety of wildflowers. It's funny, too, because every once in a while when you do a painting like this and you look at all those different colors that uh, I end up putting in, you're almost like, man, there are no places like that. And then you drive, even in the Four Preserve in Illinois, and you look at certain areas where the wildflowers are growing, and there's all kinds of colors everywhere. And they're just interwoven with each other. Then you think, okay, I feel better about my painting then. So we're almost done with the painting, probably another few minutes. And I like adding colors in the foreground. If you've uh, followed any of my uh, videos and stuff, and I hope you have and found them enjoyable, You'll see that I put flowers in a lot, and I do a couple of, but not many, winter scenes. This winter, I may change it up. I'm a summer guy, spring and summer. So most of what I paint is, uh, you know, the height of the summer with uh, flowers and green grass and stuff like that. But who knows? Maybe I can change my ways and do some winter scenes this year. Here I am adding some yellow and reds and some oranges and everything else into my grass. And basically what I'm doing is just picking certain areas at random just by, you know, the way it looks to me and deciding where I want upward grasses. And this is how I'm seeding, let's say, my rock formations. So I'm putting those grasses that I'm lifting at the base of the rock so it looks like it's actually part of the landscape. And it doesn't look like it's, you know, a separate piece. And then I'm doing the same thing to the ones on top. You gotta, you want to try and balance it. If you do something in one area, you need to do it in at least another area. 
to just balance everything. And um, once your painting has some balance, then it'll be a successful painting. And the other thing is, too, if you look at what I did, I have very few straight lines. The distant mountains and the frack formation in the front are pretty much random. They're not, you know, all identical sizes and shapes. The shapes are similar, but the sizes are all over the place. Where I have the highlights is different and things like that. And the same thing with the sky. You know, I've got some little areas almost like a little black hole, and i got some lavender coming in. Skies could be anything. I've seen some storms in the Midwest where I live that the sky was just... It's weird colors I've never even seen or heard before. So anyways, this is the end of the painting. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you do, um, please subscribe and hit that little uh, notification bell. And that way you'll know every time I upload a video. I hope everybody had a great weekend, and I'll see you later.